The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Lord, we need your steady words of encouragement. Around us, the world seems discouraged at best. We worry. Come into our hearts with your words of security. Give us a quiet confidence that we may serve well in your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The first reading is Amos 2, 6 through 7. Thus says the Lord, For three, three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals. They who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth, and push the afflicted out of the way. And the second one is Micah 6, 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. From Luke 18, 18 through 30. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one was good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. He replied, I have kept all these since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, There is still one thing lacking. Sell all that you own, and distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? He replied, 
What is impossible for mortals is possible for God. Then Peter said, Look, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not get back very much more in this age and in the age of to come eternal life. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. A few months ago, the Doonesbury comic strip ran a series on a young Asian-American woman named Kim who visited a Nike factory in China, and there she learned firsthand what the workers in those factories were experiencing on a day-to-day basis. She spoke a little bit of Chinese, just enough to know that her interpreters were not translating what the workers were really saying to her. Kim is also an American yuppie, an entrepreneur with her husband in the computer business. However, in the comic strip, she is spending her valuable time on a project of spreading the word about Nike's exploitative labor practices around the world. And so the irony for the author revolves around this yuppie social activist and the intertwining of these two realities together in one person. The prophet Amos has a word to say about this situation in the verses that were read a minute ago. They have sold the poor for a pair of shoes, or as it says, sandals in that translation. Can the factory workers who produce these shoes for wealthy Americans, afford to buy a pair for themselves? And some of these shoes will become famous. They'll be worn by professional athletes who can afford hundreds of pairs of Nike tennis shoes, while the factory workers who make them are barely able to feed their families. I had written this chapel talk a week ago, but yesterday morning in the newspaper, there was an article, an editorial, on the commentary page. And I think it says what I was trying to say, except in a much stronger way. There, were, there are four pictures of athletes across the top, and then another picture of a worker tying, uh, uh, making a pair of shoes in Indonesia. The article goes on to say that Nike pays the workers $1.60 a day, which is less than the two dollars and ten cents that it makes to that it takes to eat three meager meals per day. The shoes cost three dollars and fifty cents to make, and they sell for one hundred and forty dollars. The caption under the picture reads, "Can these athletes feel no shame at taking Nike's blood money?" Well, actually, when I started thinking about writing this chapel talk, it was the day that. The newspaper told us that Kevin Garnett would get $125 million over the next six years for signing a contract with the Timberwolves. The day came and went, and while I would bet that most people think that professional athletes are paid too much, I think it's something that we've learned to live with. And I also think we've lost our sense of moral outrage. I figured it out this week. If top professional athletes make about $20 million a year, $20.8 $20.8 million a year for somebody like Kevin Garnett. And if the lowest paid people in the Metrodome, say the ones who are selling concessions, are making minimum wage, that means that Garnett's salary is 1,800 times that of a worker at minimum wage. Well, that day as I was thinking about this talk, I also heard a sports psychologist talking on NPR as I was driving home. The psychologist said, that 66% of male African-American high school athletes, when surveyed, said that they thought they had a chance to make it into the professional sports arena. And the real statistic, according to this psychologist, is that one in 10,000 of high school athletes will make it into professional sports. The sports psychologist went on to ask what I would call the justice question. What if we shifted money away from professional athletics and put it into elementary, high school, and college sports programs? Every kid in America would have a chance to play organized sports of some kind. 
I ask that question because I want to try and uh, tell you that I'm not against professional sports. I love to watch sports. I've been to a Twins game and a uh, Vikings preseason game in the last three months. And I also, last year when the Gophers were doing so well, a bunch of us at my church went to the pastor and we said, could we change the time for the Easter vigil so that we could watch the Gophers game? The pastor said, yes, of course. And uh, my mind was not on the Easter vigil that night. I'm a little embarrassed to say that after both the vigil and the basketball game were over, I was more aware that the Gophers lost than that Easter was coming up the next day. My explanation of my, of my love of sports is more painfully uh, self-revealing than I thought it was going to be. There is something about the New Testament that is very specific, specific to a person, and in this case, in our Gospel reading for the day, specific to the rich young ruler. We do not have a Gospel of nice-sounding abstractions. We have a Gospel of specific conversations. And Jesus' words to the man are not comforting to him or to us. In fact, they are very razor sharp. The man goes away troubled and sad. And if we believe that Jesus was expressing the character of God in his words about the problem of wealth, then we, as relatively wealthy Americans, hear a convicting message, not a comforting message. I think the scary part about this text is that it's not talking about just charity. Jesus' instructions to the rich young ruler are more than that he should just give some money to the poor. He's, he's supposed to change his life. In February of this year, Martin Sabo, a graduate of Augsburg College and congressman in the U.S. House of Representatives, introduced the Income Equity Act of 1997. The bill would limit the tax deduction for top executive compensation to 25 times the salary of the lowest paid worker in the given company. The bill would not tell companies how much they should pay their employees because it would not limit the amount of pay, but it would look at the ratio between the highest paid worker and the lowest paid employee in a business. And it would tell the companies that if they want tax breaks, they must consider how they pay their workers. The bill has not been successful, but I think that it reflects the values that Jesus is talking about in the Gospel reading for today. While the Bible is about individuals, it's also bigger than individuals. It's about the kingdom of God. Jesus denounces the normalcy of systemic injustice, which ignores the poor and applauds the success of the wealthy. Jesus says it's not enough to just give to the poor. It has to do with who we are. It has to do with our very character. And Jesus, as God's representative, is saying that the very character of God is justice. Well, what are we going to do with the realization that sometimes the world looks remarkably rotten? I think that sometimes we need to reflect the razor-sharp critique of Jesus' words. The system that creates economic injustice requires systemic change, practical reform, and systematic healing, something that Martin Sabo is working at right today. We must reflect Jesus' words, not because we have to, according to the law, be but because we are followers of Jesus, because we are taking Jesus' words very seriously. We must do the same thing that Jesus did, to help, to heal, to think critically, and to bravely confront injustice. The prophet Micah says it all. What, O mortal, does God require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God, a very large task indeed. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you for life's abundance, and we ask for your forgiveness for misusing the resources that you have given us and for creating injustices and inequities. Renew our faith that we may always continue your work and ours among your people. We pray for hope 
that one day millions of people around the world will no longer perish for lack of food or medicine. We pray for joy that children will no longer suffer from strife among nations, races, and faiths. We pray for love that your tender mercies will endure as the heart of our work among your children. We thank you for those who sacrifice what little they have to assist those who have not. May your blessings be with those who help and with those in need. In your name we pray. Amen. Janelle for speaking today and lifting up a subject that we need to be reminded of constantly. Uh, along those lines, there is a need for people serving a phone bank to uh, answer some calls for those this weekend that will be going up to the flood uh, ravished area in North Dakota. If any of you happen to be around or could lend some time tonight, tomorrow night, and uh, through the weekend, any hours, uh, let me know because we'll be in touch with Lutheran Social Service who is coordinating this effort. And then a reminder that next week's chapel chapels will focus on Reformation Week because it is Reformation Week. 
Mark Tranvik, who is an expert and in the religion department on that area, will have Monday and Tuesday chapel. And, and Martin and Katie Luther will actually be here on Wednesday. And then we have some uh, other great events later in the week with the campus ministry leadership team and then the installation of the, the staff of the Youth and Family Institute on Friday with Bishop David Olson. So it'll be a great week. And we hope that you all have a great break and a safe trip wherever you might be going. Now receive the benediction. Now the service begins. Go forth into the world in the knowledge that we are God's body, that hope for a new world is in the blood of our veins, that the struggle for justice is the beat to which our hearts respond, and that God's promise is the very stuff of which our bones are wrought. Go forth to praise the God from whom all blessings flow. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you know our problems and our weaknesses better than we ourselves. In your love and by your power, help us in our confusion, and in spite of our weakness, make us firm in faith. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Have a seat. This week, you might note, is Reformation Week. Now, not all of you uh, care a, a whit about that, probably. But uh, some people who have uh, paid attention to uh, the history of Christianity, I guess, would know that this is a rather significant thing to commemorate, simply because Martin Luther did look at the way religion was being practiced in the church that he was a part of at that time, and said something's a foul here, and that sort of shook the foundations of of uh, the church at that time and has since. It just so happens that Mark Tranvik in our religion department is a specialist in Reformation theology, so we have asked him to take two days this week to look at this. And Mark, as you know, is uh, very able in many areas, but uh, particularly in this one, so he will now lead us in the rest of the service. One of the things that would have been common during the Reformation period was to have preaching services during the week, and in those services, parts of the small catechism which Martin Luther wrote to help uh, instruct Christians in the, basic of the f basics of the faith would have been used. And uh, in your order for service today, you'll notice that we have two parts of the small catechism uh, contained there, and I would like together to go through them the confession and the absolution. In other words, using the commandments as a confession and then reading together the absolution or hearing the forgiveness that came from God, that comes from God. This, again, would have been um, a regular part of a preaching service, as they called it in that time. So let us read together or confess in the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness to your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's spouse, manservant, maidservant, cattle, or anything else that is your neighbor. And now the absolution. Again, please join me as we read the explanation to the second article of the Creed. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, Son of the Father from eternity, and true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. At great cost, he has saved and redeemed me, a lost and condemned person. He has freed me from sin, death, and the power of the devil, not with silver and gold, but with his holy and precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. All this he has done that I may be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. The reading today is from Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more surely having been reconciled with we, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we will even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation.
I also want to thank Zach Curtis for participating in this sermon, as you shall see. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I'm going to speak with you about the Reformation in these next two days, as Pastor Wold has mentioned, and of course it is difficult in that time span to do justice to such an enormous topic. If you likened a comprehensive view of the Reformation to a full-length film, then what I'm about to give you, I suppose, is the equivalent of two still frames. Nevertheless, I think these two frames are crucial to the overall plot. Today I want to focus on what I call the Reformation from within, and specifically look at Martin Luther's development within the monastery. And tomorrow we will look at the Reformation without and see how it changed public life. At the age of 21, on July 17, 1515, Martin Luther did something very curious. He entered, I'm sorry, 1505, he entered a monastery. Up to this point, he had been a student in Erfurt in northern Germany. He had received his master's degree and appeared to be headed, in accordance with his father's wishes, to law school. Something, perhaps a severe thunderstorm that made him fear for his life, something made him change his mind. Now, monasteries were remarkable institutions. They were schools and libraries. In many ways, the Western intellectual heritage owes a great debt to monks for patiently copying texts, both sacred and secular, and passing them down to future generations. Monasteries also contained farms and bakeries and breweries. Monastic life was an an intricate weave of both the earthly and the spiritual. But in Luther's day, one entered a monastery because it was believed to be the most sure and certain way to heaven. It was the perfect form of Christian witness. Here was an opportunity to deny yourself, to suffer as Christ had suffered, and thus approximate his relationship to God. What, after all, could be more pleasing to God than a life wholly and purely dedicated to him? We know from some of the manuals of the day that Luther would have faced an interrogation when he went into the monastery that went something like this. You think filling out an application for college is an arduous affair. Listen to this. Luther would have entered the chapel and approached the altar where the abbot would have been standing. And the abbot would have asked him the question, what do you seek? And Luther would have replied, God's grace and mercy. And then there would have come a series of questions demanding a yes or no answer. The preliminary entrance question was this. Are you married or afflicted with any secret diseases? Luther, we think, said no. (laughs) Then the abbot would have asked him, are you ready to renounce yourself and live completely and totally to God? Will you eat little? Will you wear only the cowl? Will you worship day and night? Will you work with your hands? Will you agree to know the shame of poverty and begging? And to each of these questions, Luther would have responded, yes, with God's help. Then having entered the monastery, Luther would eventually be led to his room, called a cell, which would have been probably four by six feet with a table, a chair, and a candlestick. There was no lock on the door. One could come in at any time. No privacy was allowed. And his life would have been regulated in great detail. There would have been no decoration, no noise, no unnecessary talking. He was told when and where to bow. He was told to walk humbly with his eyes focused on the ground. He was not allowed to eat or drink out of prescribed times. There was no laughter allowed. After all, mirth might open the door even just a little for the tempter to come in. And all of this was done with an eye toward moving from self-centeredness to love of God for God's own sake. Luther tried to be the best monk that he could possibly be. 
He tried to mortify his flesh by fasting and praying and confessing his sins. But over a long period of time, he found that peace eluded him. The holy and almighty God would settle for nothing less than perfection. For Luther, it seemed as if there was always one more prayer to say, one more sin to confess. He used to drive his confessor crazy because he would confess his sins, and he'd come, of course, he had to confess all his sins. Unconfessed sins remained on you. He would confess his sins, turn away, remember something that he had forgot to confess, come back, turn away, come back. And his confessor just shook his head and said, why don't you confess some real sins to me? Blasphemy, adultery, murder. you bothering me with all these trifles. But of course, Luther was in a crisis, and in a crisis, good advice is often not heard. Christ for Luther was not viewed as a savior, but rather as an angry and accusing judge, one who was coming at the end of time on the rainbow, dispensing justice to each as they were due. And Luther knew very well what he was owed. Luther, you see, could never make himself good enough. In his own words, this is what he said. And thus began the downward spiral in the monastery, the frustration, the despair, the darkness, the spiritual turmoil that caused Luther to tremble at the prospect of his own condemnation. He really, truly felt he was cut off from God, condemned by God, and destined for hell. And then a ray of light burst through. And now here we must be very careful when discussing the turning point, because this is often misinterpreted. Luther is sometimes pictured as a great spiritual athlete who parts the clouds of confusion and finally breaks his way through to God. But you know, that is our own age speaking, an age that is infatuated with self-help spirituality. Luther didn't break through to God. He was never seen it that way. Rather, God broke through to him. And the difference is crucial. When in the monastery, Luther also undertook a serious study of the Bible. He was encouraged to do so, eventually even gained a doctor's degree in the subject. And as he engaged the text of Scripture, there emerged for him a very different God from the one that he had encountered earlier in his life. As he contemplated Christ and the cross and Paul's understanding of the crucifixion, he came to see God in an entirely new way. Christ was on the cross because of his sin, his own sin, Luther's own sin. Luther's own sin resulted in Christ's death. Now that's a horrible thought to be sure to be guilty of God's death, deicide, a serious charge. Luther felt the sting. We should all feel the sting. But more important, you see, Luther also realized that if his sin was on Christ, then it was no longer on himself. And if his sin was no longer on himself, he didn't have sin. That meant he was righteous. He was innocent. He was pure. Could it be true? His whole world changed. His world was one of imperative. You should, you ought, you must. And all of a sudden, it's indicative. You are righteous in Christ. All the time spent trying to be good enough, and here, God in Christ makes him good. What a revolutionary new view of God. No wonder Luther could say when he discovered this new God, or rediscovered this God, that it was as if the gates of paradise had been opened to him. One of his favorite ways of describing this, what he called a great exchange between Christ and the sinner, was to liken it to a marriage. Again, in Luther's own words.
For this reason, he suffered, died, and descended into hell. Who can fully appreciate what this royal marriage means? Who can understand the riches of this grace? Here, this rich and divine bridegroom Christ marries this poor, wicked harlot, redeems her from all people, and adorns her with his service. Armed with this new insight, this particular poor, wicked harlot would no longer remain in the monastery, nor would a lot of other people. As this new insight was proclaimed in pulpits and pamphlets and books, it would shake the very foundations of medieval society. And tomorrow we shall see how this revolution from within reverberated out into the public realm. Great changes were in the offing. So hold your breath until tomorrow. We pray today for the renewers of the church, in particular Martin Luther's memory. Almighty God, we praise you for the men and women you have sent to call the church to its tasks and renew, and renew its life, such as your servant Martin Luther. Raise up in our day teachers and prophets inspired by your spirit, whose voices will give strength to your church and proclaim the reality of your kingdom. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We will sing the first stanza of hymn three, 300, and then the uh, Riverside Singers will sing.
We'll begin this morning by reading Psalm 46 responsively, which is found on page 236 in the front of your hymnal. 236. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be moved, and though the mountains be toppled into the depths of the sea, though its waters rage and foam, and though the mountains tremble at its tumult. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be overthrown. God shall help her at the break of day. The nations make much ado, and the kingdoms are shaken. God has spoken, and the earth shall melt away. The Lord of hosts is with us. God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now and look upon the works of the Lord. What awesome things he has done on earth. It is he who makes war to cease in all the world. He breaks the bow and shatters his spear and burns the shields of fire. Be still then and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The scripture reading is from John chapter 8, 31 through 36. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. It is nice to be with you again on this second day of Reformation Week, and I'm grateful to be part of this celebration of the Reformation. Um, yesterday we spoke about how Martin Luther's revolution within precipitated in many ways the Reformation. Uh, we saw how Luther in the monastery was unable to be good enough for God, but then discovered that God had made him good or righteous in Christ. What happened to Martin Luther and many other people would soon have enormous repercussions for that culture. In order to better understand the public dimension of the Reformation, let us paint a before and after picture of a typical German city in the 1500s. So what I'd like you to do is kind of go on an imaginary walk with me and put yourself in the middle of this city. Say in the town square, maybe a little bit before noon, and take a seat on a bench. First though, be careful where you walk and sit. Not only are there horses and pigs everywhere, but when the taverns closed last night, the party spilled, literally and figuratively, into the streets. And some of its excesses can still be seen. So it's about 1510. You haven't heard of Martin Luther. Are you there? Okay, sit down and take a look around. What do you see in this town? First, you notice a large number of priests. In your city of 5,000, they make up about 10% of the population. They are not necessarily popular, but they are powerful. They don't pay taxes, they are often not subject to the civil laws, and more than one is known to have a so-called housekeeper, wink, wink, <laughs> and a child or two. The bishop makes them pay a fine known as a cradle tax, but no one makes too much of a fuss about broken vows of celibacy. Woe to the women and children of these unions, however. They are regularly castigated as whores or bastards. You also notice banners proclaiming today to be a special feast day in the celebration of a saint. A saint, though, that you really don't recognize. Actually, it is also not that special of a day. In fact, about one-third of the days on the calendar are given over to some kind of religious festival or observance. And today the town is to observe with a period of fasting. No one may eat eggs or butter or meat 
without a special dispensation. Needless to say, the markets and the tavern are quiet. Farmers and merchants are known to grumble because of the way the church calendar tends to adversely affect business. However, you notice there is quite a crowd somewhere else, and that is over next door to the cathedral. That happens to be a shrine where there are relics housed. There the dying and the sick, the lame and the guilty are in line, waiting to pay a fee to see some incredible sights. One cannot even speculate on the value to a soul that views some of the wonders that are within. Among the items in this shrine are a piece of the burning bush before which Moses himself stood, an entire skeleton of one of the innocents massacred by King Herod, a bucket of soot from the furnace that failed to singe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and a vial of milk from the Virgin Mary herself. You now turn and glance at the cathedral itself, whose doors are swung open into the mid-morning air. Inside you see priests kneeling before altars, saying individual masses in Latin for the souls of wealthy patrons, both living and dead. In front of the sanctuary you notice that friars from a nearby monastery are begging for alms and doing a very lively business. Many passerby are eager to give believing that such contributions are pleasing to God. Okay, now let us move forward several decades. It's no longer 1510. It's now about 1550, maybe about 30 years or so after Luther and the other reformers have begun speaking out. You are in the same town square, and once again, you've got to watch your step. Evidence of pigs and horses and humans is still abundant. But as you take your seat you notice it is not a special feast day or church day. The Protestants and their rejection of prayers to the saints have gotten rid of most of those. You also notice that there are less clergy and other religious types. There are no begging monks. As you peer into the cathedral, you are surprised to see a preacher in the pulpit, and you can even make out the words that he is saying, for he is preaching in your language, German. And the relic shrine? Well, it has been replaced by a bookshop, and among the titles in the window is a Bible, and at a price even within the reach of your pocketbook. Why have these changes occurred? In the places where the Reformation took hold, the message that we are saved by grace and through faith had the effect, you see, of weakening the church's hold on many areas of life. No longer is there a special class of clergy closer to God, nor are monks and nuns by their good works able to earn special favors with God. All stand equally in need of God's grace. Many of the human activities that were directed to heaven are now called into question. Masses for the dead, the viewing of relics, monastic discipline, the entire industry that has been built on the premise that we can do certain things to curry favor with God, that entire industry has been declared bankrupt by the Protestants and put out of business. In their place was a new understanding of God and what God wanted from people. God, you see, didn't want humanity's good works. God didn't need them. Anxiety about salvation or how they stood with God was answered, said these preachers of Protestants, was answered once and for all time on the cross. They would regularly point to the cross and say, there is how you stand with me. There on Calvary I have forgiven your sins and died your death. And between you and me there is now peace, and that is a peace that I have given you. It is my doing, it is not yours. What does God want? The question now gets changed around a bit, it becomes a little bit different. Now the question becomes, what does the neighbor need? Faith's freedom propels people back into the world, not into some kind of spiritual never-never land where dogs don't bark and children don't whine and papers don't need to be written. Luther, to give you an example, 
In the midst of marriage and family life, he himself eventually got married and had six children of his own, was one day seen in his backyard, sort of his backyard, hanging diapers on the line. Some people were walking by and they were shocked to see the famous doctor occupied in such a mundane or trivial task. They even began to laugh and snicker a little. And Luther looked at them as reported to have said, let them laugh. God and the angels are smiling. You see, God takes you then and puts you in the middle of the common and the ordinary and asks you to take a look around. There's plenty to be done, isn't there? Quickened by Christ, faith finds no shortage of things to do. The activity is not directed now toward heaven, but rather toward creation and the world and the neighbor. So in summary, the Reformation was not just a spiritual renewal. It was a profoundly public event. Luther's rediscovery of the gospel closed convents and monasteries and put priests out of work, and it made printers busy with Bibles and catechisms. Moreover, it ennobled lay life. It told the farmers and the housewives and the merchants that their callings were just as pleasing to God as that of the clergy or the monks or the nuns. And perhaps then, there is a lesson in all of that for us as well. For from God we can only receive. But we live in a world that is desperate for love and justice and kindness. And here you see it is that faith becomes active and busy. Or, as Luther said it, it is here that faith, he says, breaks out. It can't be restrained. All of life is now directed toward the benefit of the neighbor. Where Christ is rightly known, good works and love blossom and bear fruit. Think about these things. Amen. In the front of the book, you'll find a prayer for Reformation Day, and it's on page 36. And I thought, even though it is not Reformation Day... Uh, it would be an appropriate prayer to pray, especially as we remember how Mark points out how each person has a vocation and each person is seen as a valuable person, child of God, which wasn't being done at the time that Luther uh, lived his early life. Let us pray together. Almighty God, gracious Lord, Pour out your Holy Spirit upon your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now please stand and hymn, uh, sing hymn 543.
the privilege of spending a good share of one summer in the town this was written. And you'll notice on the bottom of the page, if you haven't closed the book, it says Stralsund, which is on the Ust Sea. Uh, and that was in the East German sector. Now it's all one Germany, of course. But that was a little town, or not real little, but it was a town that uh, couldn't stop talking about the fact that that's where the song had been written, and that was its main claim to fame. And every time you turn around, people said, did you know that song was written here? <laughs> we want to remind you that tomorrow Martin and Katie will be here, and you won't want to miss that. So uh, spread the word that Martin and Katie are somehow or other finding their way back here tomorrow. And uh, we also want you to know that right now is a critical time for promoting Advent Vespers. And if you could bring bulletin inserts to your churches, uh, it would be very helpful. And we have tons of them in the office. Stop in there, sign up, uh, tell how many you've taken and what church that has gone to, and that will eliminate some of our job of uh, getting them to various churches. Uh, and that also reminds us, Melissa probably will like to tell you that we need people for liturgical party. Talk to her, sign up on the door, whatever you can do. Now receive the benediction. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Creator, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, it, it took quite an effort to get them here, to be honest with you, because there they are. But I think uh, in my short conversation with them beforehand, they would like us to begin by singing hymn 230, just the first stanza of that, to kind of get them uh, acclimated to the, to the surroundings here, to create the zitz and laban, so to speak, I guess. So please stand and sing 230. of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I realize you're hardly warmed up yet to really sing appropriately, but you can imagine what it's like for me 
a man who had discovered the gospel to try to warm up Germans to singing music at all. Well, I had to go and find the places where they were most accustomed to singing with any enthusiasm. And most of you know where that is. Even if you're not a German, you understand that until they have kind of lubricated their voice box adequately with those tankards of beer or ale, they couldn't express anything with some freedom. And so, after I discovered the truth of God's grace for me in Jesus Christ, I wanted somehow to express this truth throughout the world. And so I chose music. Oh, I liken music second only to theology itself. By it you can drive away the forces of temptation, or a good hymn causes the devil to flee. So practice your singing, especially when you're going to go in temptation. For by this means you have an opportunity to express to God his great grace and mercy that you have known in Christ your Lord. And so I was a part of the wonderful reformation of music in Germany. We would sing with such enthusiasm. Why, it was pointed out to me once that more people were converted through the hymns that I wrote than through the preaching that I preached. <laughs> and so you can imagine a person like me who was interested in the word, but I wanted that word to somehow sing with the greatness and goodness of God that people would know the truth, and the truth would set them free. Ah, but alas, it may be true that there are some of you who, even in our time, are still laboring under that old and dull covenant, a covenant... Luther, it was the old covenant, which I labored under as a nun in the Nimshin convent. For you see, we too believed that somehow the more miserable you were, the greater your reward in heaven and also that the longer that journey of suffering, the holier you would become, the more purified you became, the more you suffered. This is not the gospel, but this is what we believed. But truly, who suffered and went on that long journey of death and pain? Jesus Christ. That is the suffering of Christ that we proclaim so that we are free. But we were not free in the convent. As we beat ourselves, as we tried to fast and pray on our knees and for hours and hours and days at a time. This did not get us extra credit with God? By no means. It's the suffering of Christ that we proclaim. And it was that message that drove me out of that convent as I began to read Dr. Martin Luther's writings. For this, too, was what the Reformation was all about. But indeed, suffering is a part of life. We must not uh, look past the fact that we do suffer. Suffering was part of my life. I mean, if I was being punished by God, if we thought that suffering meant punishment, then I was punished being his wife. He was not an easy man to live with. He was caught up with all of the theological issues of the day. And I must say, not only did he suffer physically in pain and agony, physically all the time, writhing on the floor in pain, but I suffered having to bear the consequences of him in such agony. I wanted to help this man. I wanted him to be, you know, living in less pain. And so I learned the art of herbal medicine. And I became very good at some of the home remedies. Why, you would be surprised at some of the concoctions I devised. Did you know that a little pig dung in red wine will cure a cough instantly? You can imagine she hardly heard me coughing when I saw the red wine coming my way. But nevertheless, I only had his, you know, his health in mind. And, um... One day, when he was lying on the floor in pain, desperately crying out to Satan to have this removed from him, he said, Katie, no dung will do me any good today. Instead, apply the word of God. Oh, the word of God, I hadn't thought of applying that. I hadn't considered the healing balm that we find in God's word, the comfort and the hope and strength that comes. For even there it says, in the world you ha will have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Jesus said this. And so I took to memorizing scripture more regularly and began to read balming, healing words to my Dr. Luther instead of all these concoctions, which, of course, he preferred. 
But even things like the peacock drove Dr. Luther crazy. He used to say, the peacock dresses like an angel, walks like a thief, but sings like the devil. I dare say the choir will not be singing like that today, so you can listen with your ears open. But suffering, yes, it was a part of me. And, and my life there in Wittenberg was not easy. We had the black plagues come into Wittenberg, where casket after casket proceeded in front of our home. And we were desperate. We were desperate to find life in this dark, dismal, horrible time. But alas, death was on our doorstep, as it took two of our children. And we didn't know how to respond except with anger to God for taking these lives from us. But again, we had to remember that when you die in the Lord, you are the Lord's. You don't have to leave worry about all of those future problems that might exist because now you are with God. And these two children, we acceded our wills to God and let them go into the Lord's arms. But this grief that we bore was almost more than we could bear. And then the psalm that I had memorized, Psalm 31, came to me, for it said, Christ knows our afflictions. And it was in that verse that I claimed the promise again of new life, of resurrection, when I realized that Christ knows everything we go through. He knows all of our trials. And the comfort came reading, Christ knows our afflictions. So claim that word for yourself today as you suffer and have many pains and trials throughout your life, that Jesus is with you in all of your suffering, and you needn't worry. While we meditate on that word, let us hear from our choir, which has prepared a special piece for us today. a gift it is to hear the song of praise sung so marvelously and thank you so much for sharing that great word of hope to each of us for in our pattern of thinking and most of our lives we live with this fear that somehow the sins which we commit in life will somehow come back to haunt us and we must live with their consequences my father trained me in this when I was a young boy he said you know, Martin, when we go to church together, you are oftentimes behaving in such a way that I must reprimand you when we get home. And his method for doing this was simply a, a stick. And he chose a stick because he knew a part of my body was, which was especially tender to its application. Why, if I had had a horse, I couldn't have ridden it for the day once he used that stick on me. And he would use this as a way of keeping me in line, thinking that somehow by using the stick he could force me to do what I didn't want to do, namely be good in church. It's quite easy for you to be sitting here comfortably, but I had to stand and listen to tiresome messages spoken in a language which was unfamiliar to me, always in Latin. 
And so the stick was his way of indicating God's path and perhaps also his own for keeping me in line. As a matter of fact, when I grew up, I came to believe that in fact God does use a stick to get us to do what we don't want to do. For I could see in the scriptures and also through what I had studied that hell is this lake of fire where people go and they die. And you don't certainly want to end up there. It sounds like a pretty hot stick to me. By the same token, heaven becomes this place of bliss. For example, when we were young, we would sometimes have to attach a, a carrot or an apple on the end of a stick to get a pig to go into the barn if it didn't choose to go there of its own accord. And by the same token, God uses heaven at the end of a stick, dangling it in front of our nose, hoping that we will somehow do more than we expected to do. You know, for example, like teach Sunday school, or give extra money, or help build the church in some other part of the world. By these means, God controlled our behavior, either with the stick at one end as a form of punishment, or the stick at the other as a way of rewarding us. In fact, I grew up believing in the stick so fiercely that when I was on my way to visit a friend, I was riding my horse and moving along, all of a sudden a bolt of lightning hit right near me. I fell to the ground thinking God, in fact, had tried to hit me with his stick from heaven. And I prayed to Saint Anne. I said, Saint Anne, have mercy on me. I'll become a monk. No point in praying to God. He just missed me once with a bolt of lightning. Why give him a chance to re-aim and reload? <laughs> and so I entered the monastery. Oh! To be a monk, ooh, what a life. But if a person could have been saved by monkery, it would have been Martin Luther. I could outfast any of them. That's changed some, but I've been through the Reformation and the diet, and the diet of worms. That'll cure anyone's eating habits. And so here I was, trying my hardest to somehow make God happy with my life. Oh, I could out-misery most of you. I mean, you may have come out of traditions where you think you know how to feel bad for God, and thereby somehow God has a, a responsibility to bless you. But, oh, I would even make tours, pilgrimages to Rome. And the more miserable the pilgrimage, the happier I was. I would come to some monasteries, and the monk would there say, well, where would you like to stay, Dr. Luther? I'd say, give me the most wretched room in the coldest, dampest place where the vermin run around on the floor and the bugs crawl on the ceiling. That is where I want to rest tonight. No comforts for me. <laughs> Walking barefoot in the snow, whatever it took to somehow let God know that I was going to be a miserable sinner for him. I would even, in my confessionals, you know, I would spend time with Staupitz. He was my confessor. And you know how it is. You go in there and you sit in your chair and there's a little barricade here. There's the confessor who listens to your confession and then tells you what you must do. I would go on for two or three hours. First of all, I had to confess sins that I knew I had committed. And then there were the sins I wished I could have committed if I'd had time. I worked at a university. I saw what the young people were doing. Oh, how I envied them. And of course, they gave me extra thoughts. And so I had to tell Staupitz all these things. Finally, Staupitz, he turned to me and he said, Brother Martin, these confessional times are getting altogether too boring. Why don't you go out and commit some interesting sins? <laughs> I had no time for interesting sins. I lived with this constant fear of God's wrath upon me. And so Saupit said, Luther, you meditate so much on your own misery. Why don't you instead meditate upon the cross of Christ? Meditate on what Christ has done for you instead of what you continually think you must do for him. So I looked at the cross of Christ and I read in scripture how the righteous by faith shall live. And I read how it is not by our works that we are saved, but by the faith of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us that makes us holy. And for the first time, not like a lightning bolt this time, but the light, the light of God flowed through me and I could see the truth of the gospel that God does carry a stick. But this is the stick God carries. And who was beaten with this stick? Were you? Who suffered on account of this stick? Did you? I did not suffer. For you know who bore the consequences of sin on this stick. And this is the only stick God needs to carry. For by this stick, the world is changed. And I believed for the first time in my life that when God looked down upon Martin Luther, he saw someone that he loved as much as Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you believe that when God looks at you that he sees someone that he loves as much as Jesus Christ? Then you believe the gospel 
And you believe that gospel not of your own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Trust that promise. You are forgiven. Nothing is held against you. Everything is held against this stick. And in exchange, you have all God's holiness, His innocence, God's beauty. That is your gift. Believe it. It is for you. Let us pray. O God, you have made us what you are, pure, sinless, forgiven, without blemish or spot. Thank you, Lord, for this great gift. In your name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. And let us sing together our Alleluia to this good news found in your hymnals, page 239. I will give a quick thank you. Johan Hinderley and Sonia Hinderley. You could have fooled us. <laughs> and um, they're involved in many ways around the Twin Cities, but one of them is that they run Mount Carmel Camp by Alexandria. And if you uh, are interested in that, perhaps you could talk to them. We remind you that tonight, 9.30, we gather for communion. Tomorrow and uh, Friday will be other celebrations of reference.